just stand one more time and give him our crosswalk welcome for Pastor Frank Potter. Blessings on you, please. What a great team. What a great team. Um, if, um, if Nate promises a coffee every morning in the parking lot when I pull in, I, I'll, hey, I'll be down here. I'll, you know, you caught us outside with coffee. You're fantastic. And, uh, and Joseph is so exciting to be around. The guy makes announcements of revival. And uh, he's just so, no, he shared, he referenced a verse of scripture uh, up here during communion. And it was like the Holy Spirit just took me somewhere. And I'm arguing with the Holy Spirit. I came in prepared to speak on something and I'm being drawn this way. It works well, though, with my personality. Um, I'm a little ADD. And um, so I present notes or something, and uh, especially to the tech team. And then I go different places. I, I'm enjoying my own journey, but sometimes it's hard for everybody to follow me. Um, but um, it was like uh, Lisa and I travel quite a bit, and we were in a hurry going somewhere, and she had a list of things, and, and she tore the list in half, and she said, you get this portion, I'll get this portion, and we'll meet at the checkout. So we went to our favorite, my favorite place as we were leaving town. I dropped her off in front of Walmart, and I... Um, went around to park and between where I parked and the front door of Walmart, there was a couple from Oregon that pulled up with the most beautiful RV you have ever seen. And uh, we got talking and so forth. And so as I'm sitting on their couch in their RV <laughs> talking, my, my phone beeps and she says, I'm at the front checkout, where are you? Um, <laughs> That is about the way I speak, you know. So we're going to go for a ride in an RV. We're going to skip the checkout and the list. Uh, and uh, Anyway, but uh, your pastors, Mark and Pam, have just been such a treasure in our life. And Lisa is here with me. And um, they have been, they are treasures. I, for one, am tremendously grateful that God sent them here and uh, they saw a church plant in this area and in the obedience in their journey with the Lord look what the Lord has done look what the Lord has done um, they are a treasure to us I know a treasure to you and a treasure to the kingdom and I still believe the best is yet to come I still believe the best of what God is going to use you to do is still in front of you and um, I remember here not too long ago visiting you and Mark in the hospital, and Mark doesn't even remember doing it. But when he saw me, he wrote on a clipboard and handed it to me or to you, and you showed me, God's not finished with me yet. He doesn't even remember doing that. And, but I believe that. I, I believe and I, I, when, when, the, when the Lord takes me from this place to where I open my eyes up, when we're, when we're absent here, we'll be present there. How many of you believe that? Absent from the Lord is to be present. With when I am absent here and present there, I want my departure to be right in the middle of what I'm doing for the kingdom. I want to be busy doing the things of the Lord, and then I, I was here and I wasn't. And uh, I believe that's where God has, God has for us. And um, usually in, in, in the natural realm, when you start getting uh, my age, of course, not Lisa's age. I'm just talking about myself. When you get uh, my age, you usually downsize and... Uh, um, I don't know, live in a van down by the river. I, I don't know. And, uh, but um, Lisa and I, about three years ago, d went the opposite direction. And, and uh, we went all in and bought a farm. And, uh, um, but, but we did that because we had a 40-year uh, dream. And we were dating um, um, about 40 years ago. I was seven. She was six. Um, <laughs> No, we weren't. But we were, we were young. We were teenagers, and we were dating, and we went to a little diner. Uh, we split a hamburger because we couldn't afford two. And, um, and this has been really our life of just dreaming. We, we just have a lot of dreams. And, and we dreamt, she still has the napkin that we wrote it on, that if God could do anything 
absolutely anything in our life, what would it look like? What would we like for it to be? And at that time, we believed that there would be a time in our life where God would give us a place where we could minister to leaders, ministry leaders that are tired, discouraged, hurt, broken. Um, and we believed someday we would have a place, a farm, and we would use it as a place of uh, rest and restoration for ministry leaders. And um, 40 years later, we now have that place that God has blessed us with. And um, the, next, the, the next season of our journey is going to be right there ministering to ministry leaders that, that just need presence, that just need the Holy Spirit to revive and restore. Um, I love presence. I, I love the presence of the Lord. And walking into this room, you can sense presence. I never, I didn't grow up necessarily, grow up in church or grow up in the proverbial Christian home. I'm not a third generation um, Pentecostal preacher. I um, came out of a, a, a brokenness and a home that was very, very dysfunctional. Matter of fact, if you want to Google dysfunctional families, you're going to see a picture of our family from Maine. Um, but anyway, no, don't do that. I'm just kidding. But the... Um, Coming out of that, how, how God can reach into the middle of brokenness and pull something out is, uh, will always be in my mind the miracle of miracles, because that's who he is. He is a God of restoration before he was a God of creation. And uh, we think, Genesis 1-1, that God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep is where God started. No, God didn't start there. God, matter of fact, God never started. But before God spoke that into existence, the word of God says that Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. So God was already planning restoration before he started creation. That's who God is. And God is in the business of restoring us to a place where he already sees us being. God already sees us completed. Uh, this is... Joseph's fault, because I was going to share this, and now my mind is on a verse that he referred to. God, God sees our end from our beginning. We see the beginning, and we try to navigate our journey, and sometimes of brokenness and hurt and discouragement. Sometimes we're on top of the mountain, and everything is going right. And the next thing you know, the rug's pulled out from underneath us, and what went wrong, and all that. We are navigating our journey from beginning to end, but God already sees the finished product. Because he sees the end from the beginning. And so God, as a, as a God of restoration, that's what he sees and what he's going to do. We look in the mirror every morning, at least I do, and say, God, you've got a lot of work to do yet. It was meant to be funny. <laughs> but God sees us. Lisa and I have our dream days. And um, where we'll, I'll grab coffee, she grabs her tea, we jump in the car, we, um, we just go for a day of dreaming. Uh, money isn't an object, just what do you feel God's doing? What do you sense, God? What do you see? And um, I grab the steering wheel, she says right or left, and uh, what we talk about in the car stays in the car. I, I, I think you all need to do that once in a while because it, it's really healthy for you. And, and uh, we just go, we dream. And um, I we, would just, we love just driving country roads and stay off the highway. And we can just slow down. I, I am an old car nut. I love the 60 muscle cars. And um, I slow up if I see an old car sitting somewhere and check it out. And, and uh, I'll, I'll drive by a field or something and I, and I see an old car in a field and I'll slow right up and look and I say, oh, Lisa, that car is so gorgeous. And she said, she'll say, Frank, that car has a tree growing through it. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll say, yeah, but the, the difference between what she sees and what I see is because I, I love old cars. I know what would, that car would look like finished. That, that's, a, that's a 67 Chevelle. That is a gorgeous car. And, and she sees it as a tree growing, with a tree growing through it, and it's a rusty old mess. But, but I see it in a way that it's fully restored, especially if it's sitting in my garage. But I, I want you to know, oftentimes we see things as a tree growing through it with all the negatives and all the issues. And, and by nature, we are negative people. 
that's our nature. When, when our early years of our ministry in Boston, you'd walk down the sidewalk, and, and it's before, I know, a lot of your times, but, but there were those metal canisters with all the newspapers, the Boston Globe and, and the Boston Herald and the Enquirer, all these, all these newspapers, and, and you would put a quarter in, and, and you would pull the thing, and you'd take a newspaper out, and um, the, one, the box that, that sold out the fastest was the one that had the worst most negative picture on the front page because we are negative people we have to work hard at being positive because that's not our nature that takes me to Joseph's reference into uh, Corinthians where Paul said that he wants us to desire the gifts but especially the gift of prophesying the gift of prophesying is a gift of encouragement. It's words of encouragement. When we speak prophetically over someone's life and you continue reading what Paul writes to the Corinthians, it's a word from God as God uses someone to speak into the life of someone else words of encouragement. And, and it's interesting to me that Joel said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see vision and old men will dream dreams. If we could reverse the chronology of that verse, old men dream dreams, young men see vision, sons and daughters prophesy. Can I, can I tell you the reason why we are losing a generation of prophesying is because we've lost a generation of dreaming. Come on, I wish you were here. We, if, if we lose our dream, then we lose the vision. And if the visionary generation is gone, our sons and daughters have nothing to encourage us about. Our sons and daughters are losing the voice of prophesying because we're losing generations of visionaries and we're losing the generation of dreamers. So I want to ask you this morning, if you, can, if you can write down one question, just one question, what do you see? What do you see? The Word of God says it this way, without vision, people perish. Now, collectively, in a group like this, we know that God doesn't give everybody a vision for the church. God gives the pastor, who is the gift to the church, the vision for the church, and vision is singular in that text, singular, people plural, people come together around a singular vision, and then you have the fruits that are cast from the collective um, ministries and gifts and talents that God brings together. But that does not exempt you from having a vision. What is it that God is speaking to you? Did you know that you are only here this morning or you're only watching this uh, because the Holy Spirit inspired you to do it? You're not even aware of it. You got up this morning, probably most of us got up this morning, got ready. It's the thing that we do. We love the church. We love the ministry here. We got ourselves ready. We came in. There's people here that we greet and we love to be with every Sunday. Love the worship. Adam, well, I don't know where you're, you're at, but man, I could have just stayed there and listened to this worship team. You guys are so anointed and so gifted. And, um, you know, I, I don't... I don't know if you're lip syncing or what, man, but you are doing a fantastic job. And there, there is, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to tell everybody that, right? <laughs> but it, it, it is phenomenal worship and stepping into the presence. But, but really, it's the Holy Spirit that got you up this morning. It's the Holy Spirit that orders our steps. And it's the Holy Spirit that has done the drawing. It's the Holy Spirit that has ordered this gathering. It's the Holy Spirit that brings us together. So if, if the Holy Spirit has brought us together, then it is the Holy Spirit's meeting. It's not my service, not your service, it's not pastor's service, this is the Holy Spirit's service. And so you and I coming in under the directive of the Holy Spirit, it is up to us to hear something of the Holy Spirit and not be distracted by all the cares and concerns of other things that are going on. I'm telling you that the enemy, the enemy in our life will distract us and keep our mouth quiet. 
If the enemy keeps your mouth quiet, there is no spoken encouragement and words of affirmation for a vision that is the response of the dreamer. If we keep our mouth quiet. So I'm challenging you. What is it that you see? And as a text, I'm not sure. I, I sent some notes to the tech team. Um, as a speaker, you're always vulnerable to the tech team. So we absolutely love the tech team. The most important people in the church is the tech team. You guys are awesome. You're wonderful. You don't give any credit. You don't get much credit. I know you can make me sound like a duck right now. I love you. You guys are great. But here is a passage of scripture in 1 Kings chapter 18. And Elijah said in verse 41, Elijah said to the servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Let's keep going. Verse 4, seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Hold that verse right there, if you would. In this text, if you would, if you would allow me to just say this, that, that Elijah really in this text represents God in what God already hears. And the servant here would represent you and I of how many times we go look and see and see nothing. How many times we've climbed to the top and we've looked over and there's just nothing to see. How many times we have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and, and it's, it's just going to the ceiling tile and coming back. But here there's a, there's a directive because Elijah has already said to Ahab, at this point by now, Elijah has already said to Ahab, Ahab came to Elijah and said, hey, look, it hasn't rained for three years. You're killing us here. And so then Elijah says to Ahab, get ready for I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Then he goes up and he sends the servant up over the edge. They're already at a very high place, but he sends his servant up a little bit higher. Keep climbing. And the servant has gone up and he has seen anything. And now he has gone up seven times. Now, I don't know how many of you would go up seven times. Oftentimes we pray, we don't hear anything, we trust that that must be God's will. No, sometimes you got to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray until you pray through and you don't give up until you lay hold of what it is that God has spoken to you and that you're believing for. Faith is not just a now I lay me down to sleep prayer. Sometimes faith is interceding and praying your way through until an answer comes. Seven times he goes up, and, and finally on the seventh time, finally the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. Now, I want you to discern, some, see something here that is a consistency throughout Scripture. God, on his part, God responds to what he hears more than what he sees. We respond more to what we see than what we hear. Oftentimes we've heard it, seeing is believing. I know in my life, uh, I was just a, a young boy, maybe 10, 11 years old, when, and, and maybe I, I've shared this with you before being here, but what, one of the things that kept me through my teenage years in the, in the brokenness that I grew up in, in the middle of the, the drug scene and the alcohol scene that was really prevalent during the 60s and 70s, what kept me from all of that, and can, I, can I say, when I say kept me from all of that, I've never even had a cigarette. Growing up in the family situation during the time that I grew up with the drugs and the alcohol and all of those things that, that were in the middle of my family, in the middle of, uh, of what I grew up in, it was like the Holy Spirit just pulled me from that and kept me. I, I, st I, I still will, the rest of my life will be invested in apprehending the reason why I was apprehended. But I, I remember I was about maybe 10, 11 years old, Adam, probably where you're sitting or in the front. And I had a, I had a friend that, whose mom was paralyzed and she was a single mom. I remember because I thought her van was so cool that she could control everything with her fingers, the speed and the brake and everything. And, and then she could spin around in her chair and push herself back in a wheelchair and press a button and the door was up and the elevator went down and she could wheel 
her way right out of that van. I thought that was the coolest machine ever created. And, but I, I just remember being in their home, the handicapped bathrooms and the wide hallways and the wide doors. She wasn't somebody that just had a backache and needed a chair. She was paralyzed. But I also watched one Sunday morning during the worship service, just a powerful move of God, where just kids sitting there, when, um, when, when some of the guys grabbed her wheelchair and just stuck it up on the platform, and I watched as people got around her and started praying that something happened in the midst of the presence of God, that she got up out of that wheelchair and she started walking her own chair across the platform. And so as a, as a young boy growing up where people were denying God and people were not only denying that God existed but they were also denying that the Bible was the infallible word of God in all of the denial of who God is or even if God is there what am I going to do with what I saw so I believe I believe God is waiting for the opportunities to manifest his presence in our lives but it is up to us what is it that we see what is it that we see what is it that God is showing us what is it that we see here, the prophet sent his servant up, and he saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And then the prophet said to his servant, go tell Elijah to, or Ahab rather, to hurry down quick because it is about to rain and it will stop him up. So the servant was the one that saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand and he was sent to the king to tell the king, hurry up because it's about to rain. So it isn't about what you and I say. It's about what we see. What do you see? When you see it, people will not be able to stop you from talking about it. The enemy will not be able to shut you up when you see it. So what is it that you see? I, I just want to challenge you that you've got to see it before you're going to hear it. In God's economy, God hears it, then he does it. I believe if you, if you look through scripture, there just seems to be a common thread, or at least I know God can act any time that God wants to act, and sometimes God responds to what he hears. I, I understand that, but there seems to be a lot of times in scripture where God has seen it, seen it, seen it, seen it, seen it, seen it, but then when he hears something, God responds to it. We are just the opposite. We've got to see it. We've got to see it first. Vision, Proverbs, I've already used the verse 29, 18. Proverbs 29, without vision, people perish. In this, in this definition that I love, there are several, but the one that I really love is vision is defined as redemptive revelation. Redemptive revelation. So when I ask you, what is it that you see, you, you, vision that God gives you isn't something that is self-edifying. What God gives you is something that is redemptive. God, I believe, gave Lisa and I a, a, a dream 40 years ago, and we could see it. Matter of fact, she wrote it on a napkin. We still have the napkin of 40 years ago of what she wrote on that we believe God was giving to us. But it is redemptive what God gave to us because it's going to be about restoring those ministry leaders that are going through difficult situations. And it's all about restoration that is redemptive in nature. So vision has to have a redemptive quality to it. If, if you can see, come on now, if you can see the prodigal coming home, that is redemptive in quality. Sons and daughters that are returning home. If you can see a marriage coming back together because that's what God wanted, that is redemptive in quality, that is what I'm talking about, vision. Some of you can see yourself serving and ministering in, in homes for unwed mothers or, or abusive homes for women or, or whatever. You, you can see a vision for, for prison ministry or, or something. If it is redemptive 
in nature, that is what I'm talking about. That is a vision that God gives. It has to be redemptive revelation. Jesus said this. He said, if you don't believe me by what I say, believe me by what you see. Isn't that amazing? Who would not believe what Jesus said? But the followers of Jesus were not believing him necessarily just by what he was saying. They started believing by what they are seeing. It is, it is uh, Numbers 21. I, I really do like this story here. Numbers 21. If you want to go there in your Bible, Numbers 21. This particular passage of Scripture is just an abbreviated highlight, if you will, from the journey that the Israelites were on. And it sounds, you can read past it so fast, and you can, I mean, you can blow through it and, and not even try to read the names and so forth. There were a few, you know, this begot that, and this begot that, this begot that. It sounds, it, it sounds like it's a mess. But until you define the terms, and then it starts meaning something. But here in this passage uh, of Numbers 21, you can start at verse 16. From there the Israelites traveled to Beer. B-E-E-R, uh, which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, assemble the people and I will give them water. Then this is a place that was familiar. This was a familiar place. It was the well in the desert. God takes them back to a familiar place. Oftentimes, it's the familiarity that keeps us settled. We stay in the familiar place because it's easier for us. What's familiar, I, I, I believe that God is about to really wreck some of the familiar places in the room. The Holy Spirit isn't about making you comfortable. The Holy Spirit is about making you more like Jesus. And Jesus said when he comes, he's going to take of mine and reveal it unto you. In other words, you're going to start seeing the things that Jesus said because the Holy Spirit is going to bring revelation to those things. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit in the room isn't to make you feel good. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in the room is to draw you into a closer walk and a more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And sometimes that journey is uncomfortable. Sometimes it's unpleasant. Sometimes it is difficult. Sometimes it, when, when he is shaping you and reforming you and, and refining you, it's not always easy. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes you want to quit. Sometimes you want to give up. Sometimes it just hurts. Sometimes it's too costly. But friends, if you stay with it, if you stay with it, because you go from the familiar place, you go from the familiar place, I, I wish I had all these memorized, but you go from the familiar place, from Bear to Matana. Matana is the gift of Jehovah. You go from Matana to a place called Nahaliel. This is the journey that God took the, the Israelites through, and the name seemed so insignificant until you define them. The torrents or streams of God. His father, Bamoth, Pisgah is the cliff, the place of safety, the place where you get with God, where it's the cleft of the rock where you know that you know that you know in your journey you're safe because he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. There's no weapon formed against you that'll, you that'll prosper because he's been walking with you. It may not be comfortable, but he's never going to change his mind over you. He's going to be with you closer than a brother. Come on. He's given angels charge over you that you'll not dash your foot against a stone. Come on, somebody. You know this in your journey. He takes you. If you are going to go from the comfortable place and become more like Jesus, if you want to really get into the streams of God's presence, then you're going to have to get out of your comfortable place and realize that God is up to something in your life. You've got to be able to see the hand of God in your life. You've got to be able to see the hand of God in your life. You have to be able to see the hand of God in your life. This is, and, and I can't help this, but here comes God. Here comes God. Because in the middle of the journey, this is what happens. Then the Israelites sing a song. Spring up a well. 
spring up a well. I can tell you, even in the most recent times of my personal journey, there's been days that I've gotten up and I haven't felt like singing. It happens. It's part of our journey. It's what God takes us through. It's part of the steps of if God's going to do something in our life, if you really see God doing something in your life, there's going to be moments where you just don't feel like singing. But something happens when we do. Can I, can I tell you? Because now when, when we make a sound, that's when God comes on the scene. What I've been sharing with you is we've got to see it to hear it. That's what faith is. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of what's not seen. But then you have on God's side, God sees it. God's well aware of it. God's watching. Matter of fact, God starts a fire in a bush without consuming the bush. Moses sees it. And when he sees it, he's attracted to it. And when he gets there, he then hears it. Are you with me? And then God speaks to him, and this is what God says. I have seen the affliction of my people. You think so? God has seen it for 400 years. But that's not the period. The period comes after this line. I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. When God hears it, God responds to it. Matter of fact, Jehoshaphat feared. The enemy is coming on every side. And, and he's the king and that, that now his nation is going to be destroyed because the enemy is so great around him. Jehoshaphat feared. And the scripture says that he set his face to seek the Lord. And this is what the Lord told him. Set up worshipers over there, worshipers over there, worshipers over there, worshipers over there. And when they began to worship God, the enemy was confused and started fighting themselves. Paul and Silas was in prison about the midnight hour. Do you think God was aware of where they were? But they started singing. The psalmist said it this way, the psalmist, the worshiper. The psalmist said it this way, come magnify the Lord with me. Adam, bring your team up here if you would. Come magnify the Lord. God, God is as big as God's going to get. How many of you know that? We, we serve a great big God. Matter of fact, God is not intimidated by mighty gods. He doesn't, he doesn't have to argue the point. He's identified as almighty God. Matter of fact, God was, God was not intimidated by them melting all the gold and building a calf. God got upset when they started worshiping that calf because they started making a sound towards that instead of a sound towards him. I believe there's an awakening. I have for three years have held the weight in my spirit. I believe there's an awakening in this nation on the horizon. The eyes of the Lord are roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may pour out a blessing. That's what scripture says. And, but I, I believe he is waiting for a sound to be heard. There is a, we have, a, we have an adversary. We have an adversary that has deceitfully kept the worship of the church quiet. He has deceitfully, he is winning by keeping us silent. Because he knows. He knows when we start speaking into the vision and we start speaking into the dreaming, when the sons and daughters start speaking into the prophesying and God starts hearing a sound, a cry from the church, the Holy Spirit stops. And as the psalmist said, the Holy Spirit is magnified in that moment. That's what he meant when he said, come magnify the Lord with me. God, the presence of God increases in a place where God hears something so the so the song spring up a well spring up a well 
It's like fire that's shut up in your bones and inside of you the Holy Spirit is just waiting, waiting for your voice to start speaking it. I believe in the room right now, someone, someone is being inspired of the Holy Spirit to just start speaking the name of Jesus. If, that, if that's you, you've, you've felt, if that's you, just stand up and say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I, I, I know, that's, that's several of you. That's good. Jesus, I love you. The Holy Spirit has reminded you of a dream. The Holy Spirit has reminded you of something that you've seen, something that you've been praying about, praying about. Some of you have been praying about, praying about, praying about, and nothing has happened. This is the moment. This is your seventh time. Just stand to your feet, lift a hand towards heaven, and say, Jesus, I love you. That's it. This is, this is a Jesus, I love you, all over the room. Jesus, I love you. This is what the Holy Spirit is speaking right now. Come on, have an ear to hear. Have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Come on, there's more of you. Jesus, Jesus, I love you all over this room. There, there are miracles. We just sang it. Adam, you guys just sang it. There are miracles. Maybe you could sing that again if you don't mind. There are miracles, there are miracles, there are things happening right now in the spirit. It may not even be in this room. It might be in a hospital room right now or it might be on a couch. It might be in a bar where somebody is drinking right now, but you've been praying and praying and praying and praying and you're seeing it, you're seeing it. And right now you're gonna speak into it in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, there are still others. You're, there's still others. You're sitting there, come on. You know it, the Holy Spirit is speaking right now. This is you, just go ahead, that's it. Just in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I wonder if you wouldn't mind, all of us in this room, for those, especially those of you that are standing right now, I wonder if you wouldn't mind making a sound. Lifting your voice, hallelujah, come on, just make a sound. Let heaven hear you. There's, there's a sound going on in heaven right now. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. There's a sound in heaven going on right now. And if you want heaven to kiss earth and earth to be like heaven, then there has to be a sound in the room. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, you are holy, God. 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 Are holy, God. Come on, let's make a sound. Keep making a sound. Don't give up. I, spring up a well. 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 Speak into what you see. Speak into what you see. If you're believing God for it, speak into it in the name of Jesus. Because God responds. God responds to what he hears. Jesus' name. Jesus' name.